<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's web webinar, Water, Water Everywhere, But Is It Affordable? This webinar is jointly hosted by the Alliance for the Great Lakes and the Ohio Environmental Council. I'm Jennifer Caddick, Alliance for the Great Lakes Vice President of Communications and Engagement, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we are excited to have over 380 people registered for today's conversation. To limit background noise, all participant lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar. To ask a question, use the question box as shown here at any time during the webinar. And we'll try to leave plenty of time for your questions after the presentation, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Also, later this afternoon, everyone on this call and everyone who has registered will receive an email with links to a recording of the webinar and to the full study that we'll be discussing later on. I'm excited to be joined by our fantastic panel of experts from around the country. Our panelists include Alliance for the Great Lakes Policy Director, Crystal M.C. Davis, who is joining us from Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio Environmental Council Managing Director of Water Policy, Pete Buecher, joining us from Columbus, Ohio, and joining us from Texas, Dr. Manny Teodoro, who is an associate professor at Texas A&M University. And now I'll turn the conversation over to our first speaker, speaker Crystal Davis. Crystal? Thank you, Jen. Good morning. Uh, over the last three and a half years, I've had the pleasure of traveling throughout this state to hear from Ohioans about their water priorities. Um, that listening tour helped to illuminate the fact that it is imperative that we recognize that communities have different relationships with our most precious natural resource. While some value recreation and the economic benefits of the lakes, others are most intrigued with protecting them as their source of drinking water. We also heard that water affordability is a major issue that deserves our immediate attention, and that's a direct quote. This partnership with the Ohio Environmental Council and Dr. Manny Teodoro helps to address community concern while conducting an in-depth analysis of affordability in Ohio. Ohio is a water-rich state with more than 166,962 miles of streams and 483,000 acres of wetlands. Approximately one-third of the state drains to Lake Erie, and the other two-thirds drain to the Ohio River. We live on the shores of the world's largest freshwater system. It is unacceptable that people around the Great Lakes cannot afford clean, safe drinking water in their homes. Water to bathe, cook, eat, and clean is a basic necessity. Water and sewer infrastructure in most Great Lakes and Ohio communities is in desperate need of repair, and these repairs are costly. When left unrepaired, failing water and sewer infrastructure causes numerous problems, ranging from lead-contaminated drinking water threatening our health and well-being to sewage overflows polluting our waterways. Ohio has over 1,100 permitted uh, combined sewer overflows in 72 communities ranging from small rural villages to large metropolitan areas. Data on the number of lead service lines in Ohio varies, um, but we believe there to be approximately 640,000 lead service lines in Ohio. Lead is rarely found naturally in source water or um, in the treated water flowing through the distribution system. Lead more often leaches into water over time through corrosion of lead in water water pipes or their components, dissolving or wearing away of metal caused by a chemical reaction between water and plumbing. Uh, lead can leach into water from pipes or fixtures. The amount of lead in your water depends on the number of leaded pipes or components in the water system. The amounts of minerals in the water, which can coat the pipes, how long the water stays in the pipes, water temperature, and a number of other factors but it's most important to note that no amount of lead can be considered safe. Ohio's estimated drinking water and wastewater infrastructure needs exceed $12.2 billion and $14 billion respectively. Environmental issues such as harmful algal blooms and lead contamination put further stress on our infrastructure. 
yet water stresses and the cost to fix them are not shared equally. Families around the Great Lakes are being asked to make unimaginable economic trade-offs in an effort to provide clean, safe water for their families. To truly address our water, our region's water infrastructure problems, we also have to address water affordability. I'll pass the torch over to Pete now. Thanks, Crystal. Again, this is Pete Booker, Managing Director of Water Policy for the Ohio Environmental Council. And I just wanted to touch on again, why, how did we get here today and to this report? Um, over the past few years, the OEC and the Alliance for the Great Lakes held a series of water roundtables and community conversations with our partners to figure out what was at the forefront of people's concerns with their water. And right along with pollution and infrastructure concerns uh, was the concerns over the affordability of their water and their drinking water as infrastructure uh, needs are, are continually driving rates up across the community. Like many other parts of the country, Ohio is dealing with uh, several things in the face of these water infrastructure improvements, like struggling about uh, balancing their budget, excuse me, along with the needs of both urbanized and rural communities. Recently, Ohio has committed important funding to water programs such as the H2 Ohio program, but as state leaders have acknowledged, much more funding is going to be needed to address Ohio's water problems from harmful algal blooms to lead contamination and water infrastructure needs. So to get to this point, we had anecdotal information on this issue of water affordability, but to our knowledge, there was not a comprehensive study of affordability of basic water and sewer costs statewide in Ohio. To begin truly understanding this issue and making the case as to why it needs to be addressed, we needed to capture the data. So thanks to the support from the Charles S. Mott Foundation, we partnered with Manny Teodoro, PhD, an associate professor out of Texas A&M University to assess the affordability of basic water and sewer utility services for low-income households in the state of Ohio. A little bit more about Manny, uh, Professor Teodoro is a nationally recognized expert in analyzing utility rates, equity, and affordability. Professor Teodoro's research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the Water Research Foundation, and he has been published in numerous peer-reviewed publications. If you'd like to read more about Manny's work after his remarks, I recommend checking out his blog at mannyteodoro.com. I'll kick it over to you, Manny. Thank you, Pete and, uh, and Crystal. Thanks very much. Uh, Pete is right. Uh, this is really, and, and also uh, Crystal, this is this is really a manifestation in Ohio of what's a national issue and national trends. I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with you today. This stuff is uh, very near and dear to my heart. It's really the, the core of my research agenda. Uh, today, my goal is to walk quickly through the measurement data and then sort of summarize our highlight results there's a ton of gory detail in the report, so if you're the kind of person who likes to uh, geek out on methodology, I encourage you to check that out. Uh, I'm going to start with measurements, and then I'll go through quickly through the data and results. Traditionally, people have measured affordability by calculating an average bill. Can you back up for a second there before we get to that? Thank you. Um, traditionally, people measure affordability by calculating an average bill and dividing that by the community's median household income. Then there's an arbitrary threshold of of 4%. If you're above 4%, you're unaffordable. If you're below 4%, you're affordable. For a lot of reasons, that's a terrible way to measure affordability. I've written extensively about that. I'm not going to bore people with, with a discussion of that today. Instead, what we did in this study is use two different metrics to calculate affordability to capture the kinds of trade-offs that Crystal was referring to a moment ago. Uh, the first of those metrics is the affordability ratio. That's the basic water and sewer service price as a percentage of disposable income. Now we can show that. Uh, it's the basic water, per capita water and sewer service price uh, multiplied by household size. You can see it there on the screen. We're going to assume for purposes of our, our uh, calculations that that's 50 gallons per person per day and our household size is four. And we're trying to capture disposable income, trying to get after the, the other uh, essential costs of living, uh, which vary considerably by community. So we're going to look at household income minus the other non-water essential expenditure, expenditures like taxes, housing, healthcare, food, and home energy. And because we're interested in 
uh, in low income affordability in particular, we're gonna focus on the 20th income percentile. So that's gonna be our next slide. We're gonna look at the, at the 20th percentile because that's sort of the traditional cutoff of the middle class. You can think of 20th percentile households as the working poor, folks who uh, maybe make a little too much money to qualify for much housing, uh, uh, excuse me, public assistance, but really struggle to make ends meet. Our other metric is uh, much more intuitive and uh, straightforward. It's hours at minimum wage, which is just that same basic monthly and water sewer service cost uh, divided by the hourly minimum wage. In Ohio, that's very easy because there's the same minimum wage statewide. Calculating it is very straightforward. Uh, it is not as good a metric because it doesn't take uh, the, the real income or other costs of living into account, but it's this marvelously intuitive number. I think it communicates this idea clearly. If you've ever had to work at minimum wage, certainly I have, uh, that's a really meaningful number. So to see how this, uh, these metrics work, let's take a look at, a, at an example. The first, I'm going to use Columbus. So here's the state capital, basic monthly water and sewer bills in Columbus for a single family home at 50 gallons per capita per day. That works out to 6,000 gallons. That's uh, $58.16. You can see the monthly income at the 20th percentile and uh, how essential expenditures look. Um, that leaves disposable monthly income of $986 and that AR20 value is 5.9%. What that means in reality is that at the 20th percentile, a family of four is gonna spend a little less than 6% of its disposable income to pay for that basic water and sewer bill. Uh, we'd look at it in minimum wage terms. It's uh, this metric's very straightforward. It's again that same 5816 divided by the minimum wage, and that gives you an hours of minimum wage of 6.8. Now, so to, to evaluate affordability across the state, we gathered rates data directly from utilities. Now, something to know about the water sector, if you're not familiar, is it's extraordinarily fragmented. There are about 1,200 water systems. Uh, community water systems in Ohio. About three quarters of those are very small. They serve populations of less than 3,300. Most of those small systems are so small, they don't have a web presence. Many don't have any full-time staff. So instead of trying to get rates data for all of them, we use a sampling strategy. Uh, we got data from all utilities that serve populations over 10,000. That's about 155 systems. And then we used a random sample of utilities that serve under 10,000. That ended up with a total sample of 305 water systems. We got water data for 303, uh, 299 systems We already had sewer data. The difference between those two is that there are four systems that provide water, but there's no, uh, there's no sanitary sewer service in those communities. Uh, that covers altogether the pop, uh, about 90% of the state's population. I want to say really quickly that response rate of 98% or, or get a success rate of getting 98%, that's extraordinary. Uh, so I feel really good about the quality of data here. Uh, I don't know what it is about, this, about Ohio. Maybe y'all are just very friendly people and uh, cooperative folks. Uh, but that's where we got the data. We, we feel very confident about the quality of the information here. Let's get to what we found. Starting with that AR20, that affordability ratio, uh, here's the distribution in Ohio. Uh, the, you can see how it, how it uh, sort of looks across the, across the, the range of values. Uh, the state weighted average is 10.6. What that means really is that on average, a four person household at the 20th percentile uh, must spend about 10.6% of its disposable income on basic water and sewer service. Uh, but the, the distribution here is what's really eye-opening. Let me, let me give you a little bit of context. Nationally, that number is about 12.4%. So on average, Ohio is uh, looking better on, on this metric, but that tail is kind of long. So if you look at the right-hand side of this, of this graph, you see a lot of communities out there uh, above 15, you know, 10 to 15 and, and even higher. In some cases, that's because of high rates. In some cases, that's because of very low incomes at the 20th percentile. So it, the, the, the story of that number is different across utilities, but uh, it's important not to get too hung up on that average since it's, it's really up one point in what's a, a really broader distribution. We go to hours of minimum wage. This is much more of a normal kind of distribution. The average is almost exactly 10. That's very closely in line with the national average. 
And then again, we see much more of a normal distribution. Uh, you see what you see on the right hand side uh, on this graph is just uh, very high prices in some communities. And part of what we did in the study is also look at some correlates of affordability. We weren't just interested in, in sort of describing the, uh, the affordability picture, but also understanding where affordability is better and worse. So we looked at a bunch of different organizational and, uh, and demographic and economic correlates. The one that's probably the single most important correlate that stood out more than anything else is size. I'm going to show you the, this first graph here is uh, probably the single most important uh, correlation. That's the correlation between a utility size and the basic water and sewer service in hours at minimum wage. You see this pronounced downward slope. That's after controlling for a, a host of economic and, and uh, social variables. What you really see here is the effect of the economies of scale. And that's a picture very consistent with what we see nationally. Um, smaller systems tend to have higher prices. Uh, that's just because of the nature of utility services. Uh, operating and staffing a, a large utility is, uh, on a per person basis and per capita basis is much cheaper. There are a lot of small systems out there that struggle to get enough people, uh, both on the, on the customer side and to have enough qualified employees on the, on the utility side. To, to operate it efficiently. So you see this, this pronounced downward slope here, uh, and that really calls, uh, really points at the, the effects of, of organizational and uh, physical economies of scale. What I think is interesting is despite, the, one of the things I think is interesting, despite this pretty steep downward slope is that we didn't find a consistent pattern between urban and rural utilities. There are some small systems that are urban and suburban, uh, operate in suburban areas. Uh, there are a lot of small systems, of course, in rural communities, but we didn't see a consistent pattern of urban and rural. What, what you see really instead is a, a different kind of composition of the, of the affordability picture in urban and rural communities. And, and we can talk about that more later in Q&A if, if folks are interested. One of the other very strong patterns we found was income inequality. So after accounting for a community's sort of overall level of prosperity, we found also that the distribution of income mattered a lot. Uh, in, income inequality is typically measured with something called the Gini coefficient, which uh, is a number that, that captures how income is distributed within a community. A very high number means uh, highly unequal. A very low number means uh, mostly equal. Uh, distribution. And you see here this, this uh, positive slope. And what that tells you is that as income inequality increases, uh, affordability gets worse. Remember, with affordability numbers, small numbers are good. We, we all want low numbers. Uh, and so when you see that positive slope, that's telling you as income becomes more concentrated, uh, the affordability picture gets worse. So in terms of affordability, kind of the, the big picture most important findings are these. Uh, first, simply descriptively, basic water and sewer service costs the equivalent of 10 hours of minimum wage labor in Ohio on average, and 10.6% of disposable income for the working class households. Again, that's average. Uh, there are some places where it's considerably better. There are a lot of places where it's considerably worse. Second is the water affordability in Ohio is not specific to urban, suburban, or rural communities. Uh, this, is, this is a problem in many parts of the state. Uh, it's, it's important not to think of this as an urban issue or a rural issue. It's really, it's really both and all. And then finally, it's strongly correlated with income inequality. As inequality uh, increases, uh, affordability gets worse. So what do you do about this? Well, the study, this study wasn't really so much focused on uh, trying to find appropriate solutions as identifying opportunities for development of policy to address affordability. The one that comes through loud and clear is consolidation. Uh, we see that, that, that strong correlation between size and affordability really calls for the consolidation of water services to the extent possible. In some cases, that can mean physical integration of multiple utilities merging into one. In some cases, it might mean uh, organizational consolidation, where you have one organization that operates multiple utilities. You can also look at changing rate structures. One of the things that we see with affordability is that 
uh, some rate structures are much more friendly to those low volume customers, which are often low income customers. Uh, so rate structures that provide uh, basic levels of service at a relatively low cost are going to be better for affordability. And then there are opportunities for development of statewide and, and local customer assistance programs. Uh, those customer assistance programs probably ought to be part of a, a broader affordability strategy, but there are opportunities uh, to develop those kinds of programs either locally or at the state level. I think that's the, the end of my prepared remarks. I don't know who's who's running our uh, our discussions now. Got it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Teodoro. That was a really helpful um, conversation. Um, we are open to taking questions now. We certainly have a lot to dig into. Um, you, anybody on the line can submit a question by using the question box shown here. Um, and uh, so take a minute and uh, type in your questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And I already see a few um, popping in here. Um, you know, one of the first questions um, that we I see here is um, in regards to that number of the uh, sort of 10.6, um, you know, that, uh, um, people are, uh, the income that they are paying and how that might relate to other utility bills. I think this is a question for Dr. Teodoro and give us a sense of, you know, we see here how much people are paying for their basic sewer and water costs. And do you have any thoughts on how that compares to other utility bills, whether it's energy bills or things that um, uh, uh, low income uh, rate payers might be paying? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we did not look at other utility bills specifically. They are, for purposes of our analysis, those other bills are bundled into that essential expenditure, so they get calculated along with things like like food and, and housing and taxes. It's also very hard to generalize. Energy bills, for example, vary considerably, just like water and sewer bills vary considerably. So there are some places where it's relatively cheap, some places where it's relatively expensive. It's very hard to say. Uh, certainly on average, energy tends to be much more expensive than water and sewer, especially in urban areas. Uh, energy tends to, to cost a lot more than water and sewer service. Those prices tend to even out a little bit in rural communities, uh, but, but on average, we're gonna see uh, energy prices are more expensive than water and sewer. However, water and sewer prices are also increasing uh, nationally at a higher, rate than uh, energy and other utility bills. So we really see the inflation hitting harder in water and sewer for some of the reasons that Crystal identified at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, replacement costs and, and uh, upgrade costs are driving prices up higher at a faster pace in, uh, in the water and sewer sectors. Thank you. Um, the next question I'll ask, um, I think I will start with you, Dr. Teodoro, and then I think uh, Crystal and Pete may want to weigh in as well. Um, and the question is sort of generally about uh, how communities or um, these utilities balance the needs for those critical infrastructure upgrades that were mentioned earlier in the webinar. You know, we have sewer overflows, we have this uh, serious problem of lead in communities drinking water. Um, and sort of balancing those needs of those costs, which are very high, with um, so that we are not uh, sort of pricing out or overburdening um, rate payers in communities. Um, so I guess I'll start with you, Dr. Teodoro, if you have any thoughts on that, and then uh, see if Crystal and Pete want to weigh in as well, how we balance those two, uh, two needs. Yeah, well, it's not easy. Uh, it's and it's really important, you know, I wanna, I wanna emphasize this study has been focused on affordability. So we're really looking at the prices. We aren't looking at the prices of not, uh, not investing in our systems. And so I, I do think that's a, a really important point to bring up. Uh, if, you, uh, per, if you make prices very, very low and you have a terrible system, you know, that's not a winner either. Um, it's, not, it's not affordable if we've got contaminated, uh, if we've got contaminated water, that you're coming out of our taps or in our environment. That's why I think some of these uh, these 
potential reforms are so important uh, that that steep downward slope we saw between utility size and price uh, in hours at minimum wage is so important. You know, driving driving that average price down can really help uh, gain efficiency overall. So you get a better quality utility at a lower price. And then it's also important to, to try to do raise prices in ways that uh, still maintain affordability through rate structures. Uh, and to the extent that, that it's feasible, developing assistance programs can help get after uh, get after this problem as well. But yeah, these are hard these are hard choices. I don't have a magic solution. Um, these these are all approaches that can help address the affordability challenge. But you know, short of of uh, infrastructure funding magically appearing, uh, we are going to face and communities are going to face these kinds of trade offs and challenges. Thanks. Uh, I think Crystal that's right. Or... This is Crystal. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. I, I agree with uh, Dr. Teodoro on that. I think one thing to note is that it, it is a tough situation, and free isn't sustainable. Um, and so we have to operate um, in the knowledge that we know that we're trying to balance affordability with paying for something that we know is, is really needed. Um, but how do we put tools in place to assist our most vulnerable citizens? Again, like we talked about earlier in the, in the webinar, um, there are folks that are making huge economic trade-offs. Um, and for those most vulnerable citizens, do we have tools in place that will provide relief to them um, so that there is not an interruption in service while um, and, and also so they are not compromising uh, the integrity of their water as well. Yeah, and this is Pete. I'll, I'll echo, you know, what was said. Um, you can't just hope that these problems go away and, and don't address them, uh, leading to more expensive repairs down the road. And when you really see some drastic rate increases for communities, um, but I think that's why it's important to have a long-term plan as these states and communities go forward for how they'll address needs and challenges uh, in a timely manner and, and do the best that they can to spread out the projects in a way that uh, ensures clean water continues to come through uh, without dumping all the, the prices and rate increases on at once. Uh, and it's going to be a combination of, of the, the broad solutions that was put forward at the end of the presentation, uh, more funding from the federal government and state governments uh, while looking to do it all the way through to rate uh, assistance programs for people that currently can't afford their bill uh, or may not be able to afford their bill in the near future. Thanks. Um, going off of uh, Pete's comment, uh, we have a question here uh, that refers to, is asking about the significant decline um, in the federal government's contribution to water infrastructure projects over the past several decades. Um, and I know this is something that uh, each of the speakers have thought about. Um, and so the question really is, is looking at that decline in federal spending on um, water infrastructure projects, how much of the affordability challenges that our communities are facing, how much of that do you think is caused by that decline in federal funding? Um, and I'll just kind of open that up to everyone. I'm not sure who would want to jump in first. This is Pete again. I can uh, start if that's okay. Um, I think it's just definitely a key reason why we're seeing some of the, the infrastructure needs um, that we're seeing, uh, but that's only going to be a part of the solution if we can get funding up to a, a higher level um, over the next couple budget cycles. Um, we're going to have to look at rate structures all the way down to the local level as well and, and do everything in between uh, to truly address this problem. Um, going forward or we'll simply end up in, in a similar spot in another couple decades uh, when projects need to be upgraded again. Yeah, I think it's it's useful to, th to look at that federal funding in context. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, drinking water, but especially on the sanitary sewer side, the federal government provided enormous grant funding of tens of billions of dollars uh, in, in 1970s dollars uh, were allocated to grants that matched local spending on those projects at a, you know, 90 cents on the dollar was paid for by Uncle Sam. 
And that was really part of a project to, to sort of help communities come into compliance with a, this brand new law, the Clean Water Act. And they, you know, the federal government recognized that that was going to be a financial challenge and so helped communities uh, consolidate, excuse me, not consolidate, construct uh, facilities to, to address those uh, problems and come into compliance. But the plan was never for the federal government to become the permanent funder of water and sewer systems. The idea was always that the federal government would help communities construct these systems, but then communities themselves would take on responsibility for maintenance and, uh, and, and upkeep and upgrades of those systems over time. Unfortunately, a lot of communities didn't do that. They neglected those systems, did not invest sufficiently in their upkeep did not consolidate. There's some evidence that Congress expected systems to consolidate in order to help come into compliance. Those things didn't happen. And so we are now in a situation where just like if you don't repair your car or don't repair your home uh, over time, things start to, to break down and fail catastrophically and then repairing becomes much more expensive. In a lot of ways, that's where we're at today with our water and sewer systems. So while certainly federal funding would help, uh, in some ways there may be the, the, the presence or, the, or the, the hope for the promise of federal funding might actually create a, a strange disincentive for communities to address their own, uh, their own problems uh, locally with a sort of just hope that, that the, the federal government is going to do something. Thank you. Um, my next question is uh, for Dr. Teodoro, um, and this is a, a question submitted um, asking a little bit more about the opportunities for Ohio and the recommendations around utility consolidation. Um, and the question is, is um, does consolidation mean the expansion of large centralized systems, or are there other models that are physically decentralized but take advantage of the benefits of consolidation? And so, uh, Dr. Teodoro, I think you're probably best suited to start off the answer to that one. Yes, definitely. Both models can work. Uh, physical consolidation is terrific when it's available. So where you have two utilities that are physically next door to each other and can interconnect, that can create greater uh, security, uh, sort of water supply security for both systems and gain those economies of scale. But I'm glad you brought this up. It is not necessary to physically connect in order, in order to consolidate as an organization. In fact, we actually see this in Ohio. Uh, you may not think of it, but probably the, the largest uh, Ohio, in, uh, Ohio utility in terms of the numbers of systems that it operates, community water systems, is Aqua. Uh, Aqua is, is an investor-owned system. Uh, they, uh, excuse me, an investor-owned utility that operates a number of systems around the state. That's an investor-owned for-profit firm, but there are also non-profit op options. There are public sector options, and these things exist across the country in different places. Uh, it's an exciting time as a lot of different communities across the country are beginning to work under different kinds of organizational models. But the great thing about an a consolidated organization that operates physically separate systems is it allows small systems the benefits of a large system. And I think that's most obvious when it comes to things like human capital. If you see a small system in an isolated rural community might serve three, four, five thousand people, it's going to be difficult to get highly qualified professional operators to work in that system. Uh, if you have any full-time staff at all, it might be two or three people uh, trying to, to manage this, this small system. If they consolidate into a larger sort of regional organization, now you can have a staff of dozens or maybe hundreds of people operating, uh, operating those same systems. You have much more qualified employees. You have a larger customer base over which to spread both the costs and the risks of that system. So it's just a, it's a much more efficient and organizationally effective way to run. And, you know, you can consolidate uh, this day and age, you know, with, with the information technology, you can consolidate two systems into a single organization. Those systems might be 20, 30, 40 miles away from each other. Thank you. Um, 
I think the next question uh, is sort of related to that, so I'll, I'll continue on the same vein. Um, and the question is, uh, although recommendations from the report are specific for Ohio, would you recommend these opportunities um, at the national level? So kind of how do some of these uh, recommendations for the state of Ohio and what they can do to address the water affordability issues, um, are they similar to what you might make uh, across the other states in the country? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. That's an easy answer. Yeah. Um, the the next question I have is um, uh, I think an important one, and the question asks why, when calculating water affordability, um, are you talking about how much quote disposable income? Um, talking in those terms, uh, and the, the the question asker asks, uh, isn't water an essential need? So I. Could you dig in a little bit more on, on the methodology question there that's being asked, uh, Dr. Teodoro? Sure. Yeah. The, look, I think what we, we might be having a little confusion around semantics. The argument here certainly is not that water and sewer are not essential. They are essential. I mean, it's difficult for me to think of anything that's more essential than water and sewer service. The argument here is, uh, or excuse me, not the argument, the, the rationale behind that metric is that we're interested in the trade-offs that customers are making. So we want to know what are customers not buying? What is a working class household not able to do because they have to pay for water and sewer service? That's why we're trying to look, rather than looking at total uh, income, we are trying to look at the income after they paid for other essential services. The key word there being other. The argument here is not that water and sewer are somehow less important than, say, taxes or food or home energy, but rather that those other essential expenditures are at least arguably in the same conversation with water and sewer as, as essential. So, uh, you know, it, what that metric is trying to do is get after the real trade-offs that households have to make and recognizing that other costs of living vary considerably in different parts of the state. There's some places where housing is very inexpensive. There are other places where housing is very expensive. And so we want to be we want a metric that's sensitive to those needs. So clearly, um, you know, we, we struggle with language trying to come up with the right word here. But that's that's uh, that's the spirit of the metric. We certainly are not arguing that water is somehow not essential. Got it. Thank you. Um, and I think I will uh, start with you on this next question, Dr. Teodoro, but um, Crystal and Pete may also want to weigh in. Um, and so this wasn't a, an issue that was um, included in this particular study, but I think it's a, an important question as we talk about trade-offs. And uh, the question here, the, the question asker says, um, in a study of the household trade-offs in Detroit, Michigan, researchers found that people rationed medication, reduced medical and dental care, um, purchased less fro fresh produce, and had other negative trade-offs to manage those water payments. Um, and the question is, have you, Dr. Teodoro, or any other researchers uh, attempted to quantify the broader health impacts of a population um, that is struggling with affordability and shutoffs? Um, uh, of their uh, water and sewer services. And so um, you may have studied that yourself or may have thoughts um, of other research from other researchers who have looked at that issue. Yeah, that, that uh, research out of the University of Michigan it, there it, and in Detroit is just some excellent work. Uh, and in, that's really what you need to do that kind of research is to get to the fine grain household level data. Um, I have not personally done any of that work. Uh, there's some researchers at uh, UCLA who are doing this sort of work in uh, in California. Uh, there's some, some researchers at Penn State that are doing similar kind of work. Personally, I haven't. Um, but yeah, certainly what we're trying to get after with the study that we did here in Ohio is to look at things at the utility level and try to identify uh, potential avenues for developing policy at the utility and the state level, because yeah, those those are real trade-offs. Um, I think the two, two lines of research really complement one another. What we're trying to capture with AR20 
and with that HM metric is those kinds of trade-offs. Uh, we, we don't want people to have to decide between their medicine and their water bill. That's in a country as, as affluent and, and uh, resource rich as ours, that should be an unacceptable trade-off. Crystal and Pete, I don't know if you want to add any thoughts to that uh, question. I, th I think he captured it pretty accurately. I think um, all, all of this is, this whole study is about the fact that folks are making economic trade-offs that, that they shouldn't have to um, in terms of just their, their household income and the, the welfare of their family. So, uh, clean water is a basic necessity, and, and we shouldn't have to uh, forego that um, in, in pursuit of something else. It's another basic necessity. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's pretty well captured, but I mean, there's a lot of, of current events and issues that elected officials have to focus on. And so uh, we're trying to, to go a next step further to highlight why it's so important uh, and make sure we can get it on, on people's radars and and as budgets and things are, are developed, um, it can be prioritized. Right, and, and picking up off of, of what Pete just said there, I think the great promise of careful measurement is that it can help frame up those discussions. When you see a number like 10 hours at minimum wage, when you see 10, 11, 12, or 20% of disposable income, what you're really capturing in those numbers is the trade-offs that Crystal mentioned. And you can say to an elected official in our communities, in our state houses, is this an acceptable trade-off? Do we think that 20 cents out of every dollar left in, in, the, uh, in the bank account ought to go to the water and sewer bill? Or do we think it, that that's unacceptably high? And so these, these kinds of metrics help, help decision makers uh, decide whether whether those numbers are acceptable or whether we need to take some actions to try to drive them down. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next question uh, digs in a little bit to the opportunity identified for um, uh, customer assistance programs. Uh, and the question specifically is, uh, which Great Lakes area municipalities um, or do you know of any uh, that have customer assistance programs that are considered successful? Um, and Dr. Theodore, I don't know if you would know of any Great Lakes region ones, but uh, you may have some examples uh, from your national work. Right, we, we didn't look at assistance programs specifically in this study uh, or analyze them. Uh, let me talk about uh, sort of nationally what we see there are currently no national or statewide assistance programs in operation. Uh, California is in the process of developing one, but right now there is nothing at the state level. At the municipal level or at the, at the local level, uh, as I think the question suggests, there are uh, hundreds of utilities across the country that operate different kinds of assistance programs. There has never been a systematic study of these programs and which ones work and which ones don't. And they take on all kinds of different forms. Uh, you know, they, they, the sort of common theme is that these are means tested programs. So people apply for them and then utilities provide some degree of benefit. Uh, there are uh, models that, that uh, just provide a straight percentage discount on the bill, some that will cap the bill. There are uh, sort of balanced forgiveness programs out there. They, some of them are quite simple, some of them are quite complicated. I'm reluctant to, to identify any that I think are specifically effective because uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a, any research on which ones are effective. Thank you. Sounds like there's a, an opportunity for some, some more researchers out there. Um, <clears throat> The next question I have um, is uh, digging in a little bit more to some of the questions, and I see a couple of questions that have popped in here around uh, privatization of uh, water utilities. Um, and so the question asks, uh, is there a, a danger with private companies like Aqua running a public resource? Um, and uh, the 
questioner continues to say, while consolidation initially comes initially seems to cut down on costs um, and staff are specially trained, there has been some regional criticism of private companies, particularly when it comes to their desire to raise rates and prioritize shareholders over customers. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure if this is particularly a question for you, Dr. Tador. I'm sure you may have some thoughts on that, but I'm sure um, uh, Pete and Crystal also have some thoughts. So I'm not sure who would want to tackle that question first. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to address that. And then, of course, uh, Crystal or Pete, if you want to jump in, that's fine, too. There are lots of different models for consolidation. Uh, privatization is one. Uh, one of those models, uh, you know, in, in Ohio, as I indicated earlier, Aqua is, is probably the biggest player. Uh, the advantages that those large investor-owned firms are offer are the ones that we've been talking about. They bring expertise to bear. They have the, they sort of allow small systems to punch above their weight by bringing the organizational capacity and expertise and capital uh, of a large utility so that little, little utilities in isolated rural communities can have the same kinds of organizational resources that a Columbus could have. Those are the big advantages. The, the disadvantage, uh, of course, is yes, rates are, the rates are going to go up. Uh, as we see, though, uh, rates are already high in small communities. Um, one of the, the, it's hard sometimes to disentangle how much of the rate increases that you see under privatization are because of privatization and how much of it is because privatization happens in, in many instances because systems are failing due to poor uh, past investments. So uh, utilities have underinvested in the past, the rates are sort of artificially low, and so they have to go up. So some amount of that rate increase was going to have to happen anyway in order to, uh, to address uh, the, the failures of the systems. And then some of it is because investor-owned firms need to make money for their shareholders. That's why they're in business. It's very difficult to disentangle those two. It is worth noting that across the country and in Ohio, uh, investor-owned firms have a much better regulatory compliance record. Uh, investor-owned firms, investor-owned water systems have uh, are much less likely to violate the Safe Drinking Water Act than um, otherwise similar small uh, uh, publicly owned uh, utilities. So there's a, there's a potential quality trade-off there as well. Um, if people are uncomfortable, because some communities are uncomfortable with the idea of investor-owned firms operating their, their water systems, uh, there are other models out there. There are nonprofit cooperative models. Uh, there are also public sector models that involve consolidating uh, under a public uh, authority or under a county level government. So there are lots of different models out there to, to help drive uh, consolidation in ways that, that, that can uh, leverage all of these organizational advantages Privatization is simply one of them. Thank you. Crystal and Pete, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on, on that question of privatization or not. <laughs> I, I think he covered it extremely well. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's a similar dynamic when you potentially look at other traditionally public services that some communities choose to go in the privatization route. So, uh, no, I won't elaborate much more. I think you nailed the pros and cons uh, perfectly. Agreed. Right. Um, the next question uh, is more for Crystal and Pete, perhaps. Um, I have a number of uh, questions here related to some of the um, sources of pollution before things even enter, uh, before that water even enters our distribution systems or reaches our uh, water treatment plants, things like agricultural pollution, um, uh, uh, things like fracking. Um, and so I know that Ohio is starting to take some steps, particularly on agricultural pollution and the issue of harmful algal blooms, which has threatened uh, community water sources, uh, most notably uh, those along Lake Erie. Um, and I know that the most recent legislation, the H2 Ohio Fund, includes obviously a lot of funding for dealing with the source pollution issues, but also this issue of affordability. Um, and so I don't know if uh, Crystal or Pete, if you would like, if have, can comment on 
how those issues are starting to be linked together at the state level. You know, some of those source pollution problems, also um, making sure that it, uh, those treatment costs aren't driving up, um, uh, exacerbating these affordability problems in a lot of our communities. Yeah, I, I can take a, a crack at that. Um, I think, you know, the H2 Ohio program that, that we got locked in here uh, in the state budget last uh, July um, was a really good step in the right direction uh, pre previously before um, this fund. A lot of the funding sources that they are, or the projects rather, that they are pursuing, um, whether that be agricultural conservation or wetland restoration um, or some of the more, I would say, generally infrastructure projects um, that the three agencies that are getting funding are going for. Um, a lot of that money largely came from the federal government before uh, the H2 Ohio fund. And so I think it's a huge step and a noteworthy step to show that you know, the state is, is putting its money where its mouth is. Um, Governor DeWine is clearly committed to improving water quality for everyone um, and trying to address these issues. And so I think that was highlighted in, in the prioritization of getting this fund passed. I think, you know, as the state goes towards year two and beyond of the program, um, it's just going to be crucial to make sure that the surface water and the affordability um, impacts are, are tied together and done strategically. Um, you know, the first year, I think it's going to really do a lot of good to uh, reduce things like agricultural nutrient runoff um, and then filtration with ODNR's wetland um, establishment of more wetlands in key places throughout the state. So. Um, going forward, it'll be important to, to make sure that they're strategically tied together and the goals are, are tied together. Great. Um, I think it's really remarkable that um, there is a focus on water issues and they've been prioritized, um, not only with the governor's office here in Ohio, but with the legislature as well. And so we they together they see that investment in our most precious natural resource is something that benefits all constituents in Ohio. And, and that's a win for us um, and for everyone. Um, I think it's important that we make sure that uh, agricultural issues related to water and then um, issues with drinking water aren't separated and divorced in our conversations about water. We need to make sure that we're talking about all of our water challenges holistically um, so that we can bring everybody under the tent, everybody um, recognizing that they have different relationships with um, the lake. And so H2 Ohio does that in a great way. There is investment in um, reducing agricultural pollution um, related to water, and then there's also investment in uh, infrastructure. Um, and so continuing to keep that focus is something that um, both the Ohio Environmental Council and Alliance for the Great Lakes will be working with community and the legislature and the governor's office on. Thank you. I have a, a number of questions here uh, related to the issue of water conservation. So I'll try and smoosh them all into one because uh, we're, uh, we're heading towards the end of our hour here. Um, and so I think there are sort of two angles that are being asked about. One is um, just the issue that you know we live in this water abundant region, and so there often is a uh, you're feeling that we can just use as much water as we want without uh, really thinking about any consequences. And what might be if what role um, uh, incentivizing water conservation could help in dealing with this affordability crisis that we're seeing. Um, but also then the uh, how utilities can be uh, perhaps incentivized to deal with the loss of water through aging infrastructure, you know, just leaking pipes and things like that, um, where we're treating a lot of water, but it's not actually reaching the uh, end uh, coming out your faucet. Um, so I think the question really is, is you know, can conservation um, and incentivizing conservation for individual ratepayers or uh, these uh, utilities, can that play a role in um, the affordability issues we've discussed? And so maybe I'll start that for you, Dr. Teodoro, and then Crystal and Pete may want to weigh in as well. Yeah, this is this is actually a great question. And the answer, this is one where the answer would be very different in different regions of the country. You know, Ohio is water rich, you know, and I, and I think of, so here I am in Texas, Parts of Texas are very water rich, and then parts of Texas are effectively desert. 
or semi-desert. And so the, the answer to the supply question varies quite a lot uh, across the country. One of the things that I think is, is fascinating about uh, water rates is that water rates that are affordability friendly, that are, they tend to help, uh, you know, help conservative water customers and tend low income customers, are also water rate structures that encourage conservation. You know, one of the things that, that makes Ohio different from lots of other parts of the country, much of the state of Ohio still uses what's called a declining block water rate, uh, which basically means that the more water you use, the less you pay, or, or less you pay on average. Your average price of water declines. 40% of the utilities in our sample, 40% uh, of, the, of the, the Ohio utilities use declining block rates. That's way out of line with the rest of the country, and certainly you, know, you will not see declining block rates in, uh, in the desert southwest, for example, because it's a rate structure that encourages or uh, at least doesn't discourage uh, high, high water volume use. Uh, so places in the country that are very water scarce, say Arizona, would never use a rate structure like that. One of the consequences of, of a declining block rate structure is it tends to load more of the costs into that the fixed charge and the first few gallons of water that people use, uh, what we call the first gallon price. So the first gallon price in Ohio tends to be kind of high, even if the average price isn't particularly high, because higher volumes uh, cost people less. All right, if your eyes are glazing over at this point, uh, the main point is this. A lot of Ohio's water rates do not it, encourage conservation. In fact, if anything, uh, they discourage conservation. And you know, to, to the extent that that you can balance those things out through rate design, that's also going to help affordability. How much that affects long-term overall system costs? That's harder to say uh, because it's going to vary from one community to another. It, it, depending on where you are in the state and what the supply situation looks like. But certainly, as the state grapples with problems of surface water pollution from agricultural runoff and other sources, uh, getting more efficient uh, use of treated water is going to be, uh, it's just going to be less costly in the long run. Thank you. Pete and Crystal, I don't know if you want to weigh in uh, briefly on, on that or, or not. I think he captured it again. <laughs> it's not that we don't, yeah, don't that have uh, opinions on this stuff, but Dr. Theodore does an amazing job of, of capturing the essence of, of the answers. So thank you for making it easy uh, for sure. us. Uh, Crystal, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, and for those of you on the phone, we are not all in the same room, so uh, trying to gauge uh, virtually who, who wants to chime in and who doesn't. Um, so one last question, you're know, reaching the top of the hour here, uh, and huge thank you uh, to Dr. Teodoro for these excellent answers. And you know, I think the final question is really for uh, Crystal and Pete on the ground there in Ohio. Uh, what do you see as next? You know, we've, we've heard a lot of great recommendations and suggestions for how Ohio can really start to address this issue of uh, affordability of basic water and sewer services, and um, what do you all see as some next steps that might be coming out of this this new research that we've all heard about here today? Sure. Um, some time ago, the Alliance sponsored a report on community engagement in Ohio, and it was titled Step One, Shut Up and Listen, and that's exactly what we did. We listened, and now it's time to act. Step two is to act. Um, you don't just listen without acting. And so now we plan to explore policy opportunities that could lead to affordability and assistance for our most vulnerable citizens. Um, we plan to advocate for increased infrastructure investment at all levels of government. This is going to require an all hands on deck approach, not just targeting the federal government or, or local or state. Um, we're working at all levels here. Um, and we also plan to partner with community um, to educate residents about these issues so they're poised to advocate for the changes that they want to see. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. This is really just a launching point. And so going forward in those various ways um, all at once is exactly how Crystal laid it out. So uh, hoping to find some real solutions that work and can alleviate some of these issues and, and essentially 
um, do this smarter going forward so we don't end up in the same place in another few decades. Great. Thank you all to our presenters, Dr. Teodoro from Texas A&M, Pete Booker from Ohio Environmental Council, and Crystal M.C. Davis from the Alliance for the Great Lakes. We really appreciate your thoughts and insights today. And thank you to everyone who joined us on this webinar. Uh, later today, you'll be receiving an email with a link to this recording, uh, the slide deck, and a link to read um, Dr. Teodoro's full study. So thank you so much again, uh, and have a wonderful rest of your day.